of Ben. Ben, in one of my first units, working on uh, problems out of his work, is specifically technically working on problems that can explore asteroids and comets, uh, very tricky, very uh, unforgiving environment. And it's been great, I usually like to say that uh, one of the key features of uh, Ben is that he never came back from a conference or a symposium without an award. Uh, like best paper award, best paper award, best presentation award. So every time he was back with some certificate. I've, I've broken that record. What? I've broken that trend. Uh, you're breaking my heart. <laughs> 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 oh, excuse me. Okay. It's a very clear path for him. Uh, Stanford just a stepping stone. So he has a very clear path. Uh, Stanford, JPL, astronaut training. Mars. It was a very linear. <laughs> so he's just here, just one stepping stone to our, uh, to our Mars. And so, okay, but well, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, everyone, for coming out, and thank you, Marco, for the uh, generous introduction. Uh, and thanks for uh, eating all my food. Uh, it's just, I know there's a lot better places you can be on a beautiful Friday. So. Um, but I'm going to talk about an ex uh, a topic that's really exciting to me, and that's uh, robotic mobility on small bodies. Um, so for the next hour, this is going to be our world. We're going to be talking about what I call small solar system bodies, or what is called small solar system bodies. Uh, there's a physical phenomenon where if a group of mass exceeds a certain threshold, it gets pulled into a spherical shape. That's why all planets are spherical and most moons of, of a certain size are spherical. Generally, this is below about 100 kilometers in diameter. So every body in the solar system below that size is called a small body. So it encompasses a huge range of diversity, not only in terms of size, you know, from small rocks in the asteroid belt to huge 100-kilometer uh, asteroid series, um, but also a diversity in terms of the origin and the type of these bodies. So you've got asteroids, which mostly are in the main belt uh, between Mars and Jupiter, uh, but also near-Earth asteroids or comets, which have highly elliptical orbits that come in from the outer solar system, uh, and even some moons, like Mars's moons, Phobos and Deimos, are both uh, small bodies because of their uh, small, irregular shape. So in addition, uh, so there's a lot of scientific interest in exploring these bodies. Uh, these bodies have been relatively preserved since the early formation of the solar system, whereas planets have undergone a lot of geology. Uh, taking measurements of these bodies is somehow taking measurements of the early solar system history. Um, so there's a lot of interest in small bodies now. There have been a lot of missions going to small bodies over the past decades. Uh, but we really haven't had any missions that put any assets on the surface. We haven't taken any surface measurements. They've all been remote observations. And so that's what this thesis is going to be about. So one of the key challenges that we'll talk about over and over again is the problem of gravity. So these bodies are so small that they have very limited gravity. And to give you a sense of what I mean by limited gravity, or what I'll call microgravity, um, let's take a look at where we put rovers in the past. So these are the only three bodies in which we have a wheeled robot right now, or in, at one point. This is Earth, Mars, and Moon, with gravity of <coughs> one-third and one-sixth of Earth's gravity, and this will all be to scale. Uh, then we've got Phobos, which is, uh, these pixels are generous, by the way, that's one of the larger small bodies, uh, and it has gravity about 2,000 times lower than that of Earth. That's, that's high gravity for a small body. On the real lo low end, you've got Itakawa, which is about 100,000 times lower gravity than Earth. So that's great in numbers, but to give you a sense, an intuitive sense of how this uh, manifest for surface assets. I put together this cute little animation where I'm going to drop all of these balls onto these bodies in their own gravity environment. Where you can see that uh, <laughs> this is for a drop of one meter. And so Phobos will take about 20, 20 seconds for it to drop, and on Itakawa we, we have to wait for four minutes. So I'm going to oh, skip that. <laughs> so this problem of microgravity was really well illustrated by the two, the only two missions that have ever attempted to put anything on the surface of a small body. Uh, first, in 2005, the Japanese Space Agency launched a spacecraft called Hayabusa to an asteroid Itakawa. Uh, it attempted to deploy a small lander called Minerva, which is about one kilogram. The problem was when it dropped the lander about 100 meters from the surface, uh, the velocity of the spacecraft was ascending at one meter per second. And so the deployment velocity was just wrong so that the, space, the, the rover floated off into space and never actually hit the surface. Uh, escape velocities on these bodies can range from a few centimeters per second to a few meters per second. So very, very low. More recently, the Europeans sent a surface lander to the surface of a comet. This is Comet 67P, about five kilometers in diameter. Uh, this lander was designed specifically to land and not rebound. It had a leg uh, mechanism that uh, allowed it to drill into the surface and a harpoon to stick itself so it was 
designed precisely so that it would not bounce. And then, of course, it bounced uh, two kilometers from its initial target point, and it landed sideways in the, in the shadow of a cliff. So it was kind of the uh, end of the mission for the lander. So these are the only two missions that we have uh, for landers on small bodies currently. So it kind of illustrates uh, the challenges and has, in some sense, incited some fear and sense of risk in the space community for these types of missions. Um, so we're going to overcome a lot of these challenges. So in addition to the low gravity, the bodies are also really weird shapes. So I'll pass around a couple models right now. Uh, these are 3D printed actual shape models of asteroids. Uh, there's one asteroid and one comet. Uh, because they're so small, they don't have this gravity to pull them into a spherical shape. So you get really wonky looking gravity fields. Uh, these two maps are a projection of this gravity field onto the surface, where on the left we're looking at the gravitational potential, uh, where the key takeaway is that it varies on the order of 50% whereas the top of Mount Everest, is sea level is only like 0.01%. Uh, and then on the right, we have a projection of the surface slope. So to give you a sense of reference, the, the traditional wheeled rover would only be able to roll in dark blue regions there because of how steep most of the surface is. So, lots of challenges. This is a, here's an image of, that was actually returned by Rosetta, just to give you a sense for the type of uh, terrain diversity, where you have some regions that, uh, some regions that look to be covered in loose regolith. We, regolith is just a scientific word for dirt. Uh, and then some rocky, cliffy regions. So very uh, inhospitable terrain for a traditional rover. And finally, this is the image that was taken of the Rosetta spacecraft that finally found this lander that bounced uh, two kilometers away from its landing point. And it was, like I said, side, sideways under a rock. Um, but again, this shows you just how irregular these surfaces can be. All right, so the problem statement of this thesis is simple. We want to develop a rover that can autonomously traverse the surface of small solar system bodies. So simple to say, but of course not as simple to implement. Uh, in particular, I'm going to break this thesis into two main uh, pillars. Uh, on the one hand, we're going to talk about the design, control, and experimentation of uh, internally actuated rover, rovers, a few of which I have on uh, display here. And the second part of the thesis, I'm going to talk about an autonomy framework where we can use these types of internally actuated rovers uh, to navigate around the body in an autonomous way. So, specifically the contributions of my thesis on these two pillars are, first, uh, the mechanical design of these internally actuated systems, uh, proposing various dynamic models so we can derive uh, different control laws for, for how do you control these, these types of weird motions, uh, and then a microgravity test bed, which um, we developed in uh, lieu of him because Steve Rock so graciously donated his gantry to us, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Also, touch a little bit on our experimental flight campaign on these parabolic flights to reduce gravity aircraft that Marco and I had the opportunity to go on a few years ago. In the second part of the thesis, I'm going to talk about this autonomy framework for hopping rovers. Where on the one hand, uh, we need to discuss the uh, problem of motion planning, which is how do you plan trajectories around these weird gravity environments, um, a novel localization strategy, which I'll touch on briefly, uh, and then some tools for extending these planning algorithms to uh, motion up, to tools that can be used for traversability analysis and mission planning. Uh, so I'll give you a bit of a sampling throughout this talk on all of these, but I'll really dive in more on the uh, experiments and the uh, motion planning problem. So let's dive into the first part. So hopping rover, so rovers are not a, uh, for small bodies, are not a new phenomenon. People have been thinking about this problem for decades, in fact, since the early 80s. Uh, and they can generally be categorized into these three different uh, mobility types. Well, on the left, we have wheeled and legged rovers. These are systems that require continuous surface interaction, either through rolling wheels or through legs with uh, anchoring appendages. Uh, for example, this is a rover, uh, a legged rover designed by JPL that has these micro spine end effectors that can uh, sort of anchor on rocks. Um, but of course, these are bound to extremely slow speeds so as to not inadvertently bump off the surface <coughs> and fly uncontrollably. So, as you might have the news from my flyer in the title slide of this talk, uh, hopping has become a very uh, popular concept for uh, mobility and microgravity because you're almost inevitably going to bounce away from the surface anyway. So the idea with hopping is let's leverage that to our uh, advantage instead of trying to fight it. So there's three general types of hopping <coughs> concepts in, in terms of uh, how they physically manifest. Uh, there's propellant-driven, externally actuated, and internally actuated hoppers. The propellant-driven uh, have some advantages. They have the ability to not only hop using thrusters, but steer the, the system in flight. Um, but they have some downsides, such that I mean, 
there's limited propellant, so there's a fixed lifetime for the, for the mission, as well as the, the plumes of the thrusters can actually contaminate the surface, which is a bigger problem for taking science measurements, uh, corrupting your measurements. So most of the people have been focused on the actual mechanical means for hopping, uh, where externally actuated hoppers involve mostly like leg mechanisms or external sticking devices to push from the surface, and internally actuated hoppers use internal masses to uh, shift momentum for hopping. In particular, I'll point your attention to the bottom two. This, this is Minerva and Mascot. These are two platforms, one kilogram and ten kilograms uh, respectively, that are actually currently flying to an asteroid on the Hayabusa 2 mission, the follow-on to that previous mission that, in, uh, that dropped the, the rover and floated away into space. So this is sort of their, um, their makeup for that. Um, so there's four of those, and that will actually rendezvous later this summer, so it'll be super exciting to see uh, for the first time a successful lander. All right, but hopping is not a new concept. In fact, the astronauts figured this out 50 years ago, that uh, hopping is a decent idea in microgravity. In fact, this is only lunar gravity, where it's one-sixth of Earth gravity. Um, but importantly, they also illustrated how difficult it can be to control hopping. So <laughs> I found this treasure trove of videos online of astronauts just falling left and right on the <laughs> It turns out it's really hard to move around. This is my favorite. This guy, this guy is fallen enough times to figure out how to get back up. So this is, in essence, what we're trying to do in this thesis, is control this type of mobility. All right. So about six years ago, Professor Pavoni set out with a group of colleagues at JPL to come up with a new architecture that could take a lot of the good ideas from these previous systems and extend it to an architecture that could enable targeted mobility, so very controlled hopping. What they came up with was a system we now call Hedgehog. Uh, Hedgehog, as you can see, the three prototypes on the table here. Uh, at its core, it's just a system uh, with no external moving parts, but three internal reaction wheels. Reaction wheels are just uh, uh, masses that are spun. It's a common uh, actuator in spacecraft. And just to give you a physical demo of how this looks, um, this is a prototype that I designed, over-designed, so that it would work in a 1G Earth gravity environment. So what's happening now is this, uh, this particular flywheel is accelerating, and once it gets to a point where it builds enough momentum internally, uh, we have an additional set of actuators, which is uh, mechanical brakes, and they actually transfer that momentum very abruptly. And so that's what essentially drives all the mobility of, of this particular system. All right, so that was just a demonstration of what happens when I spin a single reaction wheel in Earth gravity. But of course, if you have a set of free reaction wheels, you can apply torques in any direction, which could enable a broad variety of, of, of type, types of motion. And so we spent quite a bit of time uh, studying various dynamic models for understanding this motion uh, from various first principle approaches, where on the one hand, we uh, use just planar models to study this problem of tumbling, which I call pivot about uh, two of these corners and then more advanced three-dimensional models to model the dynamics and control of directional hopping. Now, uh, I don't have time to go into all the details, but um, we developed these models so that we could uh, derive analytical control off. So these are simplified to the point uh, where we could capture the essence of the physics, but still uh, derive control off, which essentially map the torques that you need to apply to these flywheels to get some desired motion. Now, for example, for a hop, if I want to hop along a certain velocity vector, uh, what flywheel speeds and torques do I need to apply in order to achieve that. So that's the, the control problem. And so we call this a suite of motion parameters because it's not only hopping, but what we just saw there was a tumble, that's really all we can do in Earth gravity. But there's other potential maneuvers too, like twisting in place or pointing cameras and so on. So this was about a year of, of effort and we uh, derived uh, controls for each of these motion parameters in turn. Um, but of course this all works well on paper with simplified models, but how do you actually test this in a relevant environment? And so that turns out to be one of the most challenging problems for developing a rover designed for microgravity. And so this has been a problem that's plagued many researchers working in this domain over the years. So I'm just going to go over a brief taxonomy of approaches that people have considered for uh, emulating microgravity. So on the one hand, you could just scale the design for a reduced gravity environment. For example, the Curiosity rover has a sister at JPL called Scarecrow, which is a one-third mass equivalent of Curiosity, so that it the terra mechanics of the uh, wheels on the soil behave like they would on Mars. Uh, of course, we can't scale this to a one ten thousandth of the mass of uh, what it would be on an asteroid, but we did develop a rover that could uh, move in a limited way in a 1G environment. And this is an example of some of the experiments we did uh, moving over various types of terrain, rocky and sandy, 
consisting of uh, tumbles and hops. But of course, this doesn't really capture the uh, dynamics that we would expect in microgravity because the contact won't be exactly the same. Uh, so we really need some way to emulate the microgravity itself. Uh, so the other branch of approaches is, is gravity offloading. This is a class of methods where you try to apply a vertical force on the system to counteract the force of gravity. And there's many different uh, test beds for doing this. Astronauts train in big pools. They use the buoyancy force to offload gravity. And this works well for them because they move very slowly. But we rolled this out because it induces a lot of drag as well. So it wouldn't work for a very dynamic uh, hopping system. There's air bearing tables, which simulate microgravity very well in a plane. Uh, we have a few of these test beds down here in the basement, and we did indeed do some early generation tests on the granite table, but uh, it doesn't really capture the out-of-plane rotation, which is really important for understanding the uncertainty and the uh, errors that might come into play after hopping. So we were really forced to come up with our own system, and uh, what I alluded to before was this gantry test bed, which is in uh, Steve Rock's lab, just 20 feet behind that wall. And we essentially retrofitted this three-axis powered gantry crane to offload the weight of the rover. In essence, how we do that is we implement a control law that automatically tracks the external forces imparted onto the payload uh, as it's uh, in interacting with the environment. So in the, just to give you a visual of what that looks like, this is the rover mounted in a passive uh, three-axis <coughs> gimbal. So it can rotate completely uh, freely in, in any direction. And what you don't see out of the frame here is the gantry itself, which is offloading 99.9% you know, .9 of the weight of the rover, but not 100%. So it still falls down very slowly. And this is real-time playback speed at about uh, 10 to the minus 3 Gs. It's still high for typical asteroids, but it starts to give you a sense of how slow the dynamics really are in uh, microgravity. So that was great, but there were some limitations with that test bed. We couldn't test very aggressive maneuvers, and we couldn't test interactions with the soil that's also itself under microgravity influence. So for that, you really need a different class of approaches, which is free fall chambers. This is where you have the entire experimental chamber falling. Um, so there's two main test beds that people use in the space community. There's drop towers, which is exactly how it sounds. It's essentially an elevator that gets the cable cut and just falls. You have about anywhere from two to five seconds uh, of, of zero-g or controlled reduced gravity. Uh, on the other hand, we have parabolic flights, which are standard commercial aircraft that are flown in these giant parabolic arcs at about 20,000 foot altitude bands. You get about 20 seconds of reduced gravity with those. And then finally, you can get infinite reduced gravity on the ISS, which is a constant free fall around here. Of course, we didn't really have the uh, money or time to put it on the ISS, so we, uh, in conjunction with our collaborators at JPL, did some parabolic flights. And I'm going to show you some of the highlights from that because this was a really uh, cool experience for us. So if you're not familiar, uh, this is what it kind of looks like on the inside. Everyone has their own payload that's bolted to the floor of the aircraft. And as I said, you get about 20 seconds of reduced gravity, but then of course you have to make up for that and you get 20 seconds of 2 Gs. So you're constantly cycling between 0 Gs and 2 Gs. Uh, we did this 200 times. And so our goal was to test a single maneuver in each of these reduced gravity arcs. Uh, so this is what our test setup looked like. We made this big aluminum frame box to house everything. We brought two prototypes, each with a slightly different mechanical design, and a, very, a variety of different test surfaces to test um, a range of possible types of surfaces that we might encounter on small bodies. And we used this, uh, an array of cameras to track the motion so we can compare it to what our predictions uh, would say. These are the four surfaces we brought. We just cover the, the rigid flat surface with Capcom tape for low friction, uh, grip tape for high friction. Um, some scientists at JPL developed this special regolith simulant material that is uh, made to mimic comet, to cut the surface of a comet. And finally, we also brought some loose sand. So here's some video snippets from this campaign. This is a hop on this uh, rough flat surface, so kind of your standard single axis hop, where it's using a single flywheel to hop about a pair of corners. Uh, this next one is showing a hop on that comet regolith simulant that I mentioned. You can think of this as sort of a, a foamed concrete. This, essentially, it is a cast concrete with air bubbles in it. If I touch it, it, it crushes very easily. And you can see how the spikes really uh, dig into the surface uh, when it pushes with high force. Uh, and finally, we were able to test on loose granular material. This is uh, garnet sand. And some parabolas, they were able to positively bias for us so we could open this box. 
And you can see, uh, it might not be obvious, but it's not hopping really in the same way that the previous ones were. It's not so much pivoting about its corners as much as it is scooping the sand behind it uh, very aggressively. So it's really this momentum transfer to the sand itself that's uh, inducing the hopping rather than the uh, rigid reaction forces. It's so a little bit of a different uh, physics going on, but it's still the generally the same, the same motion. And finally, we tested an aggressive escape maneuver. So one of the questions we get a lot is what happens if it gets stuck in the surface and maybe it comes in and it gets embedded in some loose regolith. Uh, well, we, on a whim, on our very last, I think it was our last parabola, we just decided to test this highly aggressive spin. Uh, and when we saw this spectacular spray of sand, we, we called this move the, the tornado. <laughs> it was a big mess to clean up after, too. So the bottom line from these experiments is, like I said, we had an array of cameras that we used to track the motion of the rover as it hopped. Uh, all we really need to observe is the few, first few fractions of a second after it hops to characterize those interactions. And then what we did is compare those to all of the models that we previously developed in order to assess how, how well they stack up. I don't, I'm not going to go into these graphs in too much detail, but in general, uh, dots that fall along these lines are in close agreement, and each colored dot is a different type of surface. So, uh, for rigid, flat surfaces, it adheres well to the assumptions of our models, so there's much better agreement. But of course, on the sand, we, we observed um, some areas for improvement. So we have to in invest some future effort into developing better contact models for loose regular, perhaps discrete element uh, particle models. But the takeaway message from this is that not only are we able to test and validate the control of these uh, motion primitives, but we're also able to characterize the uncertainty. And so not only what types of hops can we achieve, but with what precision and accuracy can we achieve those. Because that would be a very important uh, piece of information for planning trajectories. Okay, so that's the wrap up for part one. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the autonomy for hopping rovers. So, so far, we've really just talked about this problem of given a, a known velocity vector that you would like to achieve, how do you control your set of actuators, uh, internal actuators, to achieve that? Well. An autonomy architecture takes that to the next level. It's, it's the set of tools that we need for a rover to actually visit a specific location on the surface rather than just executing a single hop, which is ultimately what we're, what we're looking for. So this is what the uh, autonomy architecture looks like at a glance. Um, it's actually a very natural framework to have this iterative scheme where every uh, hop uh, here in the just for reference, this yellow box here is really what we've been talking about for the first part of this thesis. That's assuming you have a known trajectory you want to execute, how do you do it? But then beyond that, of course, you need to know, have a sense of the dynamics. You have to understand how that hop will propagate in the world, not only the trajectory itself, but potential impacts with the surface and bouncing. And then eventually when it lands, you kind of repeat this process. So the rover has to first find out where it is. That's the localization problem. And then uh, once you have an estimate of the, local, of, of the position of the rover, you need to do some planning. So that's the trajectory planning element. And so we're going to talk about this iterative autonomy architecture in each of these pieces. First, the dynamics, how actions influence future states. Uh, I'll touch a little bit on localization at the end, but it wasn't a primary uh, part of my thesis. And I'll focus a lot more on planning. And at a broad level, is how do you choose actions uh, to achieve a set of mission objectives. All right, so let's, let's pose the trajectory planning problem more formally. Uh, so let's call it uh, the question we're trying to solve what is the best hop to perform given a set of mission objectives, an estimate of the rover's location, an understanding of its capabilities, everything we just talked about, and a model of the world, a model of how the dynamics unfold in the world. So first we need to touch on what do the dy dynamics look like? Not just the dynamic interactions with the surface, but these uh, long trajectories. So hopping dynamics uh, are easier to think about if you uh, break it down into a flow chart. So let's consider the hopper as an agent with a state at time t, st, and it takes action at. At, let's say, is the hop velocity vector it's trying to achieve. Um, it implements this hop controller that we just previously talked about to achieve that approximately as well as it can. Uh, then, of course, once it's off the surface, it has no control. If it doesn't have thrusters, there's no way for it to steer its motion uh, once it's off the surface. So um, it's just purely gravity, gravity effects at that point. So of course the ballistic dynamics require a gravity model, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but essentially it's very difficult for small bodies to, to model with traditional methods. Um, but eventually it's going to re-impact the surface, so we also need to have an idea what the shape of the body is. So we need to detect collisions using a shape model, and the models I just all passed around were 3D printed versions of shape models, so we need to have a good idea of what the geometry of the body is, 
so that we can predict and forecast where it will land. And finally, we need to have, an under, have a model of what will happen when the rover impacts the surface. Either it will impact fast enough and rebound with enough energy so that it goes into the rover's <coughs> dynamics again, in which case you just have this, this looping uh, architecture, which is essentially a series of bounces, or eventually it'll stick to the surface and, and, and finally land. There's not a lot of rolling dynamics when you use a regular geometry, so at a high level, this is how we decouple dynamics. So this has a lot of unique characteristics when you compare it to traditional robot dynamics. For one, the cadence of this entire step, the state to the next state, uh, can be on the order of hours. Uh, hops and microgravity, as you saw how slow those dynamics were in the test bed, imagine that at a 100 meter scale or kilometer scale. So it, it's not, it wouldn't be unheard of to take a hop and it takes a few hours for it to hit the surface. So that means that there's huge implications for taking right or wrong actions. Um, so the mobility cadence can be very long. Uh, also, there's various sources of uncertainty. All of these models that I have here can be quite crude at times. So it can lead to gross uncertainty in the final landing state, especially when you have this, these series of bounces. Uh, and like I said, this can compound chaotically over the course of several bounces. And so to give you an intuitive sense of what this looks like, uh, here's a Monte Carlo simulation of 50 randomly sampled hops, all trying to hop at the same nominal velocity vector, but of course there's this huge chaotic scattering of the bounces. This simulation illustrates how irregular the gravity fields can be. This it takes into account the rotational dynamics of asteroids, which can actually rotate quite quickly. So it's not always intuitive to A, even predict uh, where the hopper will land in a perfect model, but B, to understand the scattering effect when we take into account any bounces. So this looks pretty, pretty hopeless for planning, but uh, we're going to propose a few techniques that try to overcome this gross uncertainty. All right, so we tackle the trajectory planning problem in two uh, primary ways. First, uh, we propose a shooting method, which is attempt to answer the most basic question of how do you even choose, how do you even solve for what velocity you need to get from one point to another in these irregular gravity environments. And we'll extend that to some sequential planning methods. And secondly, we want to really capture the full uh, uncertainty of this model. And we do that in a markup decision process uh, framework. I'll talk about more in detail of these. So let's focus on the trajectory planning problem. All right, so how would you plan a single trajectory? You, we need to an answer two questions here. First, um, what velocity is required to go from a known start location to a known destination location uh, in time t. This is a very well-known two-point boundary value problem called Lambert's orbital boundary value problem. It has closed form solutions for simplified gravity models like spherical gravity or perturbed gravity. But when you have these extremely irregular gravity fields, it's, it's, it's not, there's no closed form solutions. So we propose an algorithm to solve for these using a shooting method. And I won't go into too much of the detail, but essentially we constructed this algorithm in a way that robustly solves for all solutions for any time t. And to give you a sense of what that looks like, each of these trajectories is a valid solution to this problem for a different time t, where the color trajectories represents the different solution classes of these. It's interesting to point out from an astrodynamics perspective, for a spherical gravity model, there's only two classes of solutions uh, for, within a single orbit to connect two points. But for this body in particular, uh, the algorithm found a third class of solutions. So by and large, we're going to take the most direct hop from point A to point B, but this is just an, an interesting property of these gravity fields. But this, is, of course, assumes an exact version of the dynamics. So we also need to understand how uncertainty uh, propagates through these trajectories. And so thankfully, the shooting method we developed here gives you the Jacobians for free. It gives you the, uh, the variance of the uh, output position based on the, the covariance of your input velocity. So all we can do is, uh, so all we need to do is uh, use a standard first order error propagation methods to propagate this throughout the trajectory. And pictorially, this is what it looks like, where you have a covariance which essentially can be thought of as an ellipse, which is propagated and swept through this trajectory, and finally uh, projected onto the surface at this contact point. And this is what that looks like for three example trajectories from these, one, one from each of these classes, where the colorized surface is really the probability distribution of where the rover might land. Probability distributions are much more useful than knowing a specific point, because now, if we have some uh, understanding of the uncertainty of the hop, we can start to answer the question, in expectation, what's the best hop to take? So this is more of a probabilistic question we can start to address. All right, so what can we do with these tools? Before we start to extend this into a framework that really accounts for bouncing, um, 
we can, ex we can take this two-point boundary value problem solver and extend it to a framework that solves many two-point boundary value problems. So let's say we want to plan a trajectory or plan a sequence of trajectories uh, that or, or get to a point that may take more than one hop. So you need to use many trajectories. So the way we tackle this is to discretize the, the surface. This is essentially the state space of the rover at rest, where, each, where the surface is just kind of colorized based, based on the, the local neighborhood. Um, and then we can compute the, this solution between any pair of points within its reachable set. So for example, from this particular point, all of these, all of these trajectories connect it to all of its neighbors within some energetic radius. And these are all colorized by the minimum speed that it would take to hop to that particular destination. Okay? So if you take this picture and then in your head imagine that that's done for every single point, now what we're left with is a very highly connected graph. And a highly connected graph is very easy to, to rapidly plan it. So what we can do, for example, is a traversability analysis where, for example, we have this uh, target destination marked by the star there, and these trajectories are each colorized by the number of hops it would take for it to, for a, for a rover at that point to get to that location. Now this can be done in a forward reachable set way or a backward reachable set way. So these trajectories can equally be simulated in reverse as well as forward. So this can be thought of either as the optimal uh, sequence of actions to go from any point to that star point, or uh, the optimal actions to go from that particular point to any other point on the body. Now this works really well when we have a, a low amount of bouncing, right? So if the rover impacts the surface and it sticks more or less where it impacts the surface, uh, this can be executed uh, pretty robustly, but it starts to, its performance starts to degrade when you get erratic bouncing because you can't, you can't really trust the fact that you can take the next hop in this, this formula. So that's where the second uh, batch of methods come in. And this is the MVP formulation. All right, so markup decision process at a high level, for those that are not familiar with it, is a general purpose framework for modeling sequential decision process, uh, where we take an arbitrary agent, in this case it's our rover, um, and we need to define its state space, its action space, uh, a reward, something, some objective that it wants to get to, uh, and a model of the dynamics. And so the, the hopping problem is very naturally cast into this framework because uh, in contrast to some robot, motion, or robot problems that are modeled as MDPs, you have to discretize the time domain in order to make this framework fit. This time domain is inherently structured so that every action is taken uh, you know, once the rover finally settles on the surface. So it's a very natural idea for modeling these types of uh, planning problems. So let's just go through, in turn, each of these elements to see how we might model this problem as an MDP. So we define the state space of the rover um, most generally as its pose on the surface. So that's in R6, it's, it's position and orientation. But if we assume that there's some uh, lower level controller, for example, the controllers that we developed in the first part of this thesis, we can simplify the state space and say that it's just the position on the surface. In other words, we can say that the rover has some lower level controller that can reorient it properly to execute the next hop. The act, so this is what that might look like on the surface where it's, for example, latitude, longitude. This is on the, any, anybody can be mapped to the surface of the sphere. Uh, the action space of the rover could be modeled in a variety of ways. It could be modeled at the actuator level, uh, these flywheels, um, you would have three control inputs at that point. Um, or you could model it at a higher level. We choose to model it as the actual velocity vector represented in the body frame. Uh, because there's a, because uh, if we modeled it as the actuators, then we'd have to use a state space that incorporates the orientation. So this turns out is a much simpler way to model the, the action space of the rover. And, so that's what that looks like for each of these particular actions, so A1, A2, A3. And importantly, there's some constraints on the action space. So when a rover is sitting at a surf on the surface with some <coughs> local normal vector, uh, it can only really hop within some friction cone of that local surf surface normal. It can't hop just to the right or just to the left. So if the rover is leaning to the left, it can't really hop to the right as easily. So you can envision the action space as a constraint uh, really dictated by the, the local pose of the rover on the surface. And finally, we need to define the reward. Of course, the reward is a very general structure in the MVP framework, so it could be used to encode many things. Uh, but in the simplest example, you could think of it as uh, incentivizing a, a goal region. So let's say you give a big plus one reward in that green circle and a, a negative one in this red circle. And penalize every hop for a, time, a weighted 
uh, average of its time and energy and expectation. And so this is what the state action reward structure of a, the most basic version of a MVP for hopping rovers would look like. So let's see how, um, oh, so there's one more element to this that we haven't talked about, and that's the transition model. So in the MVP, you need the state action reward and a transition model. So we've already talked about the dynamics. So what would the transition model look like in the context of this flowchart we presented earlier? Well, it would really be everything inside this box, where we have our, our state, our action. Uh, our goal is to derive this, this policy. Um, but of course, all of those, the, those chaotic trajectories and the bouncing makes this very difficult to model. And so uh, this problem has a lot of unique characteristics that, that uh, really force our hand to a very limited set of methods for solving this MVP. The ultimate goal being to find a policy that is in some sense optimal for choosing actions given the state of the world. All right, so reinforcement learning is a common framework for solving uh, and MVPs where you uh, rely on data. Um, there's, there's two classes of methods, model-based and model-free. For all the reasons we just talked about, model-based model methods are very difficult. Not only is it difficult to write down an explicit model of dy dynamics, but it's also hard to come up with a function approximator the dynamics. So we really chose to explore more model-free methods. I actually did try for a long time to, to work with model-based methods, but it was really just hard to fit any reasonable function approximator to these chaotic dynamics. So we really were forced to a model-free approach. Um, any rover is also going to have heavy computational constraints. The hardware on board is really limited, so we'd like to leverage as much as possible offline simulations. So that really motivates um, offline learning as much as possible. Uh, simulations themselves can be quite expensive, even when they're on uh, very capable computers on the ground. Uh, these, this propagation through this irregular gravity field, it turns out at every time step you have to compute the gravity, which is a sum over the entire uh, body. So it's, it's an extremely computational thing to even simulate a single trajectory. So this motivates a data efficient type algorithm. Um, we'd also like to be able to investigate how the policy would change given a different reward structure. Let's say now we don't only, not only want to visit a specific location, but maybe many different spots on the surface, or change our objective, change our constraints. We want data that is representative of a broad uh, variety of trajectories. In other words, we don't want to just generate trajectories and, and data from a given location to a target location, like a broad exploration strategy. Um, and finally, there's these discontinuities in the action space, which I just mentioned is very heavily influenced by the pose of the rover on the surface. So this really motivates learning a value function rather than a policy directly. So these constraints really force our hand on choosing a reinforcement learning algorithm that, that fits this bill well. And it turns out there's a very popular algorithm that's shown a lot of success in various robotics domains uh, over the years called least squares policy iteration. And I'll give you a high-level description of what that looks like. So LSPI, as I'll call it, has two inputs, a batch of data. So the data is just simulation data. All those Monte Carlo simulations I showed you earlier, that's, those were 50 examples of data where we have a given start state, action, which is this velocity vector, and final landing state. And of course, our reward model, we then tell it what reward it gets given that state action next state. And so batch of data D, um, the least squares policy formulation relies on a linear combination of features, state action features, so that's uh, features in, in function of S and A, and so it's very important to come up with a very rich set of features so that we can represent uh, the true value difference across the state action space. And this is the basic uh, algorithm of, of least squares policy iteration, which iterates between these two steps, as does any policy iteration algorithm, where in the, on the one hand you have policy evaluation, which essentially comes up with the best approximation, the best weights of these features uh, to approximate the true value function. <coughs> And it turns out for this particular type of problem if, with, with this linear representation, that's an exact fixed point projection. And that's, that's, um, that's guaranteed to be very close to the, uh, the true optimal. And policy improvement is the second step where it's just extracting the optimal action given that, um, given that function approximator. So this is the, the biggest equation I'll give in this uh, thesis, but don't ignore all of this. Really what you're looking at here is just the least squares problem. So every iteration here, you're, you're essentially solving a, a, a big weighted least squares problem. So it's very efficient. And it's a very efficient use of data as well, as opposed to, for example, deep learning methods, which are notoriously data inefficient. All right, so let's go back to a simple problem and see how this works. Okay, so your output would be your, your optimal weighted feature. 
All right, so here's an example where we have just a very simple reward structure. We want the rover to get to this green circle on the surface. So the, we're going to say the reward is a big bonus when the rover finally gets there. So that's a plus one in that circle. Uh, we'll give it a minus a penalty every hop, depending on how long it takes. So every hop will be penalized based on time. Could be energy as well, but for now we'll just keep the time. Um, and we'll just do non-discounting for now. So again, all right, so what do the results look like? I, I won't go into an exhaustive analysis of, of this method, but I'll show you an example where we compared the policies that this method produces with more simpler uh, heuristic policies. So here's a map of showing three example rollouts of the learned policy, where each in each case, the rover is deployed from this a mothership, which is presumably right there. It initially bounces. And then it takes its first action. Each of these takes its own optimal first action according to the, the policy we just computed. And of course, in general, it, it hops towards the goal. Um, but sometimes it can actually hop backwards, which is an interesting learned behavior that sometimes it's better to hop away from the goal in order to facilitate better future actions. There's a lot of in learned interesting behaviors. Another one is this green trajectory here decides it's a better idea to hop up here, which is uphill from the goal. So it actually kind of tumbles down into the, the goal region. So some interesting um, emergent intelligence from this, from this algorithm. Now when we compare that to a heuristic, so the state of the art before this was essentially just to uh, hop towards the goal. Uh, it's the simplest thing, the most intuitive thing you could, you could think of. And it works well for flat and level terrain. Oftentimes the best thing to do is just to hop directly towards the goal. But sometimes it's not so good. For example, if you don't have a good understanding of the elasticity of the surface, and the rover bounces more than you anticipate, it could overshoot very easily. Or it might have a very poor understanding of the gravity model. If it just hops directly towards the goal, it might actually veer off course given the rotational dynamics. So what I have, the, the color maps here encode the value function of each of these. So on the top, we have the, this is the optimal value function projected onto the surface, where as you expect, it decays the further you get away from the goal region. On the bottom, I have projected the value difference between the optimal policy learned here and the heuristic policy. Mm -hmm. And so the blue suggests that the heuristic actually works well in some regions, but as you get farther away from the goal or on certain uh, steep slopes, the heuristic policy actually starts to break down and it does not perform as well. So there's a lot more that we, uh, different case studies that we've, um, we're looking into, but this is some uh, preliminary all right, finally, I'd like to talk about localization. So this wasn't primarily my work. This was mostly carried out by our colleagues at JPL, particularly Issa Nesnes and Rod Reed. Um, but I'll give you a single slide um, <coughs> snapshot of our approach to localization. Uh, so we break it down into two phases, uh, two approaches. On the one hand, you have the localization problem where the rover may be completely lost on the surface. You have no idea where it is. This was the case of the Philly lander when it bounced and the team had no idea where to look for it. On the other case, you might have a very good idea of where the rover is in general, but you want a very precise uh, localization within that constraint. And so on the left, we use, we propose a, a novel method I call gravimetric localization. The key intuition behind this method is that the gravity on the surface of those bodies, as I showed on that one slide with the rotating asteroids, can be very irregular. And so if you take a surface measurement of the gravity uh, with an accelerometer, you can actually very tightly constrain where that measurement must have been taken on the surface. Uh, it turns out you can get a very inexpensive, small, lightweight sensor that can measure this gravity vector with an unbelievable precision. And if you have a decent gravity model, let's say some internal density model of the body, uh, you can actually very tightly constrain generally where the rover would be in. In our paper, we actually showed that if the Philly lander had had this sensor on board, it might have been able to, been, they might have been able to find it much sooner than they otherwise did, which took them like two years with uh, constant searching of cameras. All right, but this doesn't really get you meter level localization. This kind of constrains you within tens of meters. So on the other hand, we have a two-phase vision-based approach, where before even, deploying the, before even deploying the rover, the mother spacecraft orbits the body and creates a global feature map. Uh, essentially, this is traditional visual SLAM, if you're familiar, so, uh, simultaneous localization and mapping, where over the course of many orbits, it builds up with a, a very dense feature map of the surface. And then it deploys the rover to the surface. This is a video of some experiments we did in the visual analog environment. Uh, and these are some representative hopping trajectories where you can see the uh, localization estimate over here. Uh, 
Um, importantly, when it hops high enough, it can actually establish feature correspondences between its own cameras and that of the global map and um, correct for any drift that has occurred. So this is very much ongoing work, but this is just a one slide snapshot of, of how we're thinking about localization. It's by no means a solved problem. There's tons of future work. All right, so in summary, this is the planning architecture that we've been talking about. Uh, first, in the first part of this thesis, we looked at solely the hop, what I have called here the hop execution, uh, where we have dynamic models used to understand these various motion primitives. These are simple things like a homogeneous rigid cube pivoting about a corner, where you can compute these control laws analytically. Uh, this inspires the different types of motions that you might be able to achieve, for example, hopping, tumbling, or twisting. And then we have to test those uh, maneuvers in a test bed. And so we did this, uh, I showed you some experiments on this uh, gantry system, as well as the reduced gravity aircraft. And ideally, we'd like to be able to close the loop and refine our models. Uh, we've done some of this, but there's still much more work that needs to be done, for example, in refining the contact model with the, the loose sand. Um, then we talked about the dynamics and how when you extend this to a global architecture, these trajectories can become very hard to predict, uh, counterintuitive when you have these weird uh, gravity fields, and then when they scatter with a high degree of, of bouncing, become even more difficult to predict. We then proposed two different planning frameworks, a model-based and a model-free method, that attempt to capture the essence of this, like, these dynamics in the model-based context, we try to solve this two-point boundary value problem between any two points and extend that to a traversability graph across the entire surface, which works well for systems that we wouldn't expect to have a lot of bouncing. So for example, a rover might very well have some damping material on it so that when it impacts the surface, it just sticks to the surface. In that case, it might be better to use a model-based method. Um, but when you have just a passive system that might experience a high degree of bouncing and uncertainty, you really want to go for model-free uh, data-driven methods, which we just uh, talked about. And then finally, we have this hybrid localization uh, framework. So this is my thesis in one slide. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so for everything I did in this thesis, there's 10 other things that I haven't done. And in my, in, in my paper, I outlined maybe 50 things that are, would be useful for extensions. But I'll just highlight a few key ones here. On the side of dynamic control, it's really important that we uh, not only investigate the dynamics of hopping, but also attitude control. Attitude being the control of the orientation of the rover in flight. It's actually a very good opportunity to take images uh, for science and navigation. If you can go from this rotating system, which has a lot of uh, angular momentum as, as it leaves the surface, and stabilize that with those reaction wheels. Uh, it's a very common problem in spacecraft attitude control, but there's a lot of unique challenges to the system that need to be addressed. Also, like I mentioned a few times, hopping on loose granular surfaces. This is a real can of worms because discrete element models are notoriously computational, and so we'd like some kind of hybrid approaches that maybe use discrete element models, but also uh, some more abstract models with bulk properties where we can use more iteratively. Um, so those are two methods for extending dynamics control. On the planning side, uh, I just showed you a few uh, snapshots of what we've done, but there's so many different ways that this can be extended and should be extended if it were to be applied in, in, in real life. And so the most important of which is adaptation. So all of the policies and plans that we've generated have been offline, given some model or simulator. But of course, the rover is going to collect a lot of information and learn more about the environment as it interacts. So it's important to be able to take that information to, into account. For example, if the rover refines a model of the surface geometry, or the uh, elastic contact properties with the surface, we want to be able to feed that information back into the planning framework and come up with better actions. Also taking into account state uncertainty. Here we've tackled the planning and localization problems sort of in parallel, but of course they have very intimate interplay. A uh, model of uncertainty will affect the actions, and your actions will also affect your localizability on the surface. So this could be very well passed into a POMDP uh, framework, which uh, We've dabbled in, but definitely needs to um, deserves more work. And of course, we need to kind of push the limits of the MDQ framework and try and solve more complex missions. The MDQ framework is a really powerful tool. While it requires much more data to solve for these policies, uh, the reward structure is very powerful and able to capture not only the example I showed where you're trying to go to a specific location, but it could capture constraints such as uh, the need to recharge solar uh, with your solar panels, so staying in sunlit regions of the surface or, uh, for example, thermal considerations or avoiding potential hazards 
So it's a very flexible framework, and it'd be interesting to see if we can push the limits of what types of things we can achieve with that. And finally, on localization, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit here in terms of not only using this gravity model to infer the local uh, the localization of the rover, but also to do the inverse problem, that is, refine the gravity model of the body given localized uh, surface measurements. This is a common geophysics technique called gravimetry, and it's got a lot of thought possibility for understanding the internal structure of the bodies for, for scientific purposes. And then, of course, we'd like to extend this to see what kind of synergies We'd let, uh, we might encounter if we have communication with the mother craft. So a rover will presumably not be able to communicate directly with Earth. It will always need a nearby mother spacecraft in order to do the communication. So that, of course, gives it the ability to uh, perhaps use the, local, the, the Doppler ring <coughs> signal from the mother craft to do localization more accurately. So that might have some synergies. Okay. So before I conclude, there's uh, so many people I need to thank for all the help that they've given me throughout this whole process. First and foremost, my committee. Uh, Dustin, thanks so much for agreeing to be my chair on short notice and, and with such enthusiasm. Uh, I hope to see a, more work on icy body, extraterrestrial icy bodies in the future, maybe potential collaborations. Steve Brock, thanks for also agreeing to be my chair, although you don't technically qualify because you're in my department. <laughs> <laughs> um, and specifically, thanks for letting us use your gantry, which has been uh, super useful. Uh, I, I took all three of your classes, and it definitely was a formative part of my time here. Um, I might not remember all how to draw a Nyquist plot, but I'll definitely remember, oh. like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I definitely remember what a soapbox is. <laughs> and just generally uh, how simple intuitions can, can take you a long way, so that's, uh, thank you. Um, Simone, uh, astrodynamics is very close to my heart, and so uh, for its ability to really, um, well, enable space exploration, but also just break a lot of our terrestrial intuitions, and I think no one champions that message better than you. And I always look forward to going to your class to see what cool toy you had next. So, so, so thanks, and keep up the good work. Uh, Michael, uh, although we have an ongoing rivalry between labs, uh, <laughs> and we have undisputed athletic prowess. <laughs> <laughs> we still have the Duran Cup. <laughs> to be addressed very soon. <laughs> no, I've always enjoyed our meetings, and you've been so available whenever I wanted to meet. And, uh, come out with crazy, more ideas than I can possibly uh, work on every time I know you, so, so thanks so much. Uh, and Marco, it's been a, a long road. Um, you've... Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> You've seen me at my best and my worst, um, notably on the vomit comet. <laughs> Day one of the vomit comet, I was good after that. <laughs> but just thanks for giving me like the confidence to pursue uh, ambitious and totally unfamiliar uh, research paths. It's a huge boost in confidence for me throughout this past four years. And the ability to sort of forge my own path. You kind of were very in the loop to begin with, but over the past few years I've kind of Totally taken in my own direction. So thank you for that freedom and for allowing me to travel the world and sometimes to meet international collaborators, but sometimes just to climb mountains for fun. So thanks for those many opportunities. Uh, of course, I need to thank my my family, ASL. Uh, you guys have seen more of me and I've seen more of you than probably any other people in the past years. So there's just so many experiences we've had together. Uh, this this is just a snapshot of them. But one of the experiences that kind of stands out in, as a memory for me is our trip to Tahoe where we got snowed in. Uh, we kind of defined some rules for the entire Stanford community because of this, but uh, <laughs> no, there's, <Thank> you. <laughs> there's really no, yeah, it was a good group of, good group of people to be stuck in the cabin that you had to be, so uh, And then more generally, I need to thank so many of my other uh, family and friends who've really been there for me along the way. Uh, and of course, I couldn't find pictures of everybody, so if you're not here, I apologize. But just so many people from my friends at home in Delaware, uh, friends I've made in New York, uh, and then all the friends that I, I knew no one coming here to the West Coast uh, for the first time, so everyone has kind of brought me in as their family. Uh, just thank you so much. Uh, and last but not least, I have to thank my family, my mom and dad, Kim and Joe, and my sister Jordan, who have been just nothing but supportive of me uh, through my entire journey through life, especially putting up with me traveling so far from home. So, so thank you. All right, I'll take questions. <laughs>
Thanks for the talk. I think that was really awesome. Um, I uh, was wondering, you may have said this, but what kind of features are you using for the policy integration? Yeah. So it's their state action features. Mm -hmm. So some have to be representative of, of the, the state and some of the action. Um, so we have a set of, so in general, as is common in robotics, we have a set of, set of handcrafted features and some basis functions. Handcrafted features are things that we intuit might be useful in as, as a feature, like ener energy, these kinds of things. But then um, the basis function is actually particularly interesting because it's not a standard uh, Euclidean space; it's the surface of a sphere. Mm -hmm. We actually use a Fourier basis, which is a um, paper by Konadar, <coughs> um, which actually ch turned out to be really useful for because you don't have these singularities of the poles with, with that. With that mm -hmm. system. Um, so that was a a basis over the state and action space. So in all in all, there's a few thousand features. Okay. And then uh, my second question is, the you said the action space is a cone, um, yeah. but for certain parts of the certain, well, it can be constrained based on what your state is, but your your state doesn't include your orientation. Right. Um, so I was wondering if you did any if, if there was actually any constraints on the action space based on like where you were on the, the thing, or, or yeah. whether you've done any analysis of, in the real world, like what part of your action space would be Yeah, so by. the short answer to that, well, no real short answer to that, yeah. but um, in general, you have a shape model of the body. So yeah. if a rover is at a particular location, you have an average surface normal mm -hmm. that the rover may be in. Of course, there's a lot of surface detail that your shape model won't account for, like large rocks and boulders. So uh, your action space is, is pretty much purely dictated by the, the, the orientation of the rover, right? Where, how it's leaning. So you, what I do in my framework is I assume that this lower level controller can reorient it such that it points in the average surface normal of the local topography. So even though the shape model doesn't capture a lot of the irregularity of the surface, uh, we assume that the lower level controller can orient it so that the action space is normal to the surface. This okay. cone is normal to the surface. Yeah. Daniel? Yeah, uh, I just had a quick question. So you mentioned at the end um, using the reaction wheels maybe for attitude control uh -huh. during the middle of the hop. That was something I was wondering about during the talk. Does that have the potential to help with the bouncing problem significantly? I mean, is a flat landing much better than a corner landing? It could landing? be. It could be. And, and impacts, uh, rebound mitigation strategies is something we've looked at a lot, actually. Uh, turns out the harder problem is not so much uh, the orientation that you hit the surface, it's what the shape of the surface is that you're going to contact anyway. Because you're not actually going to see the centimeter scale features that the rover will hit on the surface until seconds beforehand. So there's not really much you can do robustly to, to prepare for that. Yeah. Yes, you can stabilize the attitude, in which case you also have a lot of stored uh, angular momentum internally, which complicates the dynamic rebound less significantly. Um, but Based on our simulations, you can generally bias this distribution, but you can't really uh, dampen it out completely with that. Okay. And then as a quick follow-on to that, I mean, that's one of many sources of uncertainty, obviously, in modeling. Can you speak to which of those is the primary source, if there is one that's more important, or are they all kind of equal? Yeah, certainly, well, if you have, if you have a hopper that has very poor control, uh, this cone of trajectories that represents your uncertainty for a desired hop could be quite big. So in that case, your, your control uncertainty would be larger. Uh, for our case, in general, when, at least there's a lot more that needs to be done on characterizing the uncertainty of this particular system, um, but we went with about a 10% uh, covariance with respect to the velocity vector. And in that range, the bouncing is actually a much bigger source of density because you have this chaotic effect. Yeah. Especially when you impact a, a point that's high in geopotential, so it could fall downhill significantly. I'm wondering about the size and shape of the balancer. Um, why did you choose this particular yeah. configuration? And like, what do you think would be different if it was bigger, smaller, or different shape? Yeah, so one of the key features of the Hedgehog platform is that it's totally scalable. So these are just three representative sizes where you would have different uh, sign. You're, you're, and the short answer is your size would depend on the science instruments you want to bring. Uh, so if you want a microscope, you have to make it big enough to uh, take a microscope and all the you know, batteries and avionics required to house that. But the mobility principle is scalable, so that the flywheels can be sized according to your mass and payload. So there's really not too much uh, functionally in terms of the planning that would change. Of course, maybe you'd interact with different scale features on the surface, but uh, in general, it's, a, it's totally scalable.
And um, another thing is, um, so is it powered by battery? Is that what you guys? So have you thought about kinetic energy since it is moving, like how that could help with power as well? Regenerative, you mean? Or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Uh, in terms of absorbing impact energy, that's uh, very difficult and doesn't give you all that much. Um, regenerative braking of the flywheels themselves also turns out doesn't give you all that much. Uh, just to be clear, like this is way over designed for Earth gravity. Like you would never need a, as aggressive as motors uh, of motors as we have in the system. So when you actually work out the entire energy budget of the whole system, taking into account thermal regulation, communication systems. The mobility power is actually only like less than 10% of the total energy budget. So that's why the inefficiency of this type of internal actuation is a huge deal breaker. Right Can you comment on the principles used on in those other hoppers you showed at the beginning, like the Minerva platform, for example? Yeah, so Minerva had a, a single flywheel on a turntable. So it could, uh, it had a, the axis of the flywheel was like this, but it could, it could rotate that axis. Uh, it's, it really only did mobility. It really didn't have any science instruments except for a single little like cell phone camera on there. Um, so it was really a, it's a technology demonstrator. Um, a, t a flywheel on a turntable is, has some problems because you need to accommodate a huge volume to sweep out this flywheel. So we went with, and some other platforms too. I don't know if you've seen MIT's M Blocks project has the same gimbaled reaction wheel. Um, it just requires a lot more volume. This is actually a very low form factor solution.